In early childhood, I found my great-grandfather. Of course, he was very old. He survived the entire Soviet regime, saw a terrible famine, and participated in the Great Patriotic War. In memory of this, he was left with a scar on his left cheek and the habit of eating every crumb from the table. I remember how my sister and I were brought to visit him. He took out a handkerchief containing several pieces of sugar and handed it to us. It would seem like ordinary sugar, but from his magic handkerchief, it seemed like it was the most delicious. He died when I was five years old. Many years have passed, but I still love to remember him. And that was the prelude, now the story itself. I was preparing for a history test and remembered that we have a large and very old encyclopedia kept at home. By the way, it's in my grandfather's book collection. I went to look for it. As always, the book was buried at the very bottom in the farthest corner, so I had to rummage through the entire bookcase. While I was rearranging the books, a thick envelope fell out of somewhere, as it later turned out, containing letters. Most of the letters were addressed to my great-grandmother, written by my great-grandfather. I read a couple of letters. My soul immediately felt warm. I remembered my childhood, and the times when the whole family was together. Among a large number of letters, I found one addressed to a certain Nikolai Baikov, and it was this letter that I have decided to publish here. Below is the letter itself. Hello, Nikolasha. Anton is writing to you. This is my grandfather. How is your health? How is Varochka with the children? Have you moved to the city, or are you living in the countryside? I am writing to you for this reason. I am afraid to tell anyone. They'll take me for a crazy person. But you love this topic. Maybe you can help me. In August, 1965, as a geographer by profession, I was sent on a business trip to the redacted region. Our task was to travel around free villages that were burned during the war, to mark new and old roads in the area, fields, and small, lonely buildings to check the location of forests and rivers. The villages, Menina, Gurka, and Pekina, were located along the lake, quite a long distance from each other. They quickly assembled a team of 18 people. I knew only six people in it. Oleg Ostashka. This was our commander, a young guy, younger than me, but with a strong backbone, so he treated everyone very strictly. Dima Korshinova. This is my colleague, Semyon Bakala, Daniel Zotov, and Gleb Baranov. These were ecologists. Why they were taken into the group, I don't know. Another, Vova Sabrudny, the driver whom I knew from the war. The rest were conscript soldiers, provided to help us. Since the road ahead was long and difficult, they gave us three brand new cars, just from the factory. One was a Gaz 47 on tracks, and two Urals. They gave us three days to do everything about everything. The route went like this. First, drive through Menino, from there to Gurka, then along the Ishka River. Fortunately, cars were allowed to, to Pankino, and from Pankino to the already residential village of Pachinok. We didn't waste time. We left. At first the road was boring and monotonous. We often met people along the road, but closer to Menino, there were much fewer passers-by and the road became narrower and overgrown. Here it is, the village of Menino Old, a village built back in Zara's times. All that was left of Menino was a charred pillar standing in the middle of a fairly overgrown square and the stone foundations of some houses. As on the map, the village no longer exists, as well as the field, which once upon a time served as sowing for potatoes, peas, and other crops. On his pocket map, Menino crossed out the inscription, circled, and shaded the area of the village. The ecologist walked around the former yards, touched something, looked at it, and we moved on. We spent about four hours on Menino in getting there. We moved on. We drove along an old road, also deep in the forest, where it was very dark, even during the day, so no grass grew, and the road was clearly visible. I began to feel some discomfort already in this forest. It's not for nothing that no one has walked along this road for twenty years, and Gorka is bypassed. Even in the camp, locals told how recently five people, either hunters or fishermen, disappeared there, among whom there was even an in-tourist. 
Having driven away from the village, we settled down in a small clearing. The cars had to be left in the mud, but they were not afraid of it. In the clearing, the guys found old German coins, bolts, cogs, but the main find was a rusty BMW motorcycle dug into the ground without wheels and a seat. This meant only one thing. German troops passed through here during the war. It got dark. Time to get ready for bed. Like many others, I threw a tarp on the ground as a sun lounger and covered myself with a jacket. The nights were warm, so no fire was lit. Already in a semi-conscious state, I noticed some movement in the bushes. I raised my head. A tear-stained little girl stood ten meters from me and looked at the sleeping men with horror. I rubbed my eyes, and after that the girl was no longer there, it seemed. I walked around everything. No one. And how could a child be here? We are in the forest, and also very far from the nearest populated area. We were on the road almost the entire next day. The road was bad and difficult to pass. I kept thinking about the incident that happened at night. While I was sitting thoughtfully in the back of the Ural, we drove out, slowly but surely, onto the field, and the driver switched from swearing again into Russian, smiled and again, fell in love and respected each other. As soon as we drove out onto this field, I felt a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. The field was large. It was clear that it had been mowed for cattle before. But what's more, it was mowed even now. It felt like it was just a month ago. In the distance on the field, there was a barn for hay. Whoa, car, Ostashko ordered loudly, trying to shout over the car engine. Everyone got down to the ground. Great job. This means that someone is mowing the field for their own needs, without the knowledge of the Kolkhoz. No, we need to check the barn. Maybe they store hay there. Privates, Shivalov, Motsev, check the barn. Run. Can I go with them? I turned to Ostashka. Why can't you? The young commander answered. The going was easy. The grass was cut all the way to the barn. The guys opened the doors, and the last rays of the sun setting penetrated the building. That's right. The barn was filled with hay. It's bad luck for the one who mowed down if they get caught for it and could go to jail. I walked along the building, examining the walls. Scratched on them was Oya plus Chopa. The nail before. Crossed out inscription. Katya, you are the best. I smiled. This is how I wanted it in my childhood. In our childhood. Kolya, anyway. We returned to the car. The guys gave a report about the barn and the car started moving. This time, I did not climb into the back because I was feeling seasick. Zotov and Baranov walked behind, talking heatedly about something. I joined them. They asked me, occasionally, questions. I answered them in monosyllables, and more often admired nature, but the feeling that something didn't return so quickly as soon as we entered the forest. The first car stopped. We went to see the reason for the stop, the reason was promised by a pillar with a plaque on it, where there was the inscription, Gurkha, and an arrow pointing forward. Well, it's been preserved for twenty years, Semyon noticed. So, on the right track, Zeprudny said. The column moved on, and here we are again. The field also mowed down. Ah, uh, whore, Ostashko cursed. Well, absolutely. Who would go here to mow by the end of the day? And you can see the houses over there. Baranov pointed his finger. Indeed, at the other end of the field, there was a hill and the roofs of houses were visible. We decided to leave the cars here in the field for now and go and explore ourselves. When we approached the village, music was clearly heard. That's right, from the radio hanging on a pole in the middle of the square, the voice of a singer was heard singing a song from the 30s. People were singing and dancing in every yard. Mostly they were old men, girls, and children. We decided to split up and ask people where we ended up. Semyon and I went to the house closest to the road. There were about six people talking vigorously, eating and drinking. A little girl about six years old noticed us and drew her grandmother's attention. The old woman jumped up and ran towards us. Hello, well done guys. Where did you come from? The friendly old lady hurriedly asked questions. Yes, we are urban, I answered, not knowing what to ask her. 
Where did they possibly come from? How did they get here? There should not have been anyone here for 20 years. What, what kind of village is this? As always, Semyon asked, stuttering. Slide, my dear. Maybe you can go and have a drink, Grandmother asked. No, no thank you. What kind of holiday are you celebrating? How about it? The city has been liberated. Here, any victory is a celebration. The grandmother answered with a smile. You come in. There is no truth in your fate. We walked to the table in shock, but did not sit down. These are the times. Either it was their own holiday, or the old people had gone crazy. But we did not ask questions. Drink, dears. The grandmother put two piles on the table. Presumably it was moonshine. Semyon grabbed the glass and drank it in one gulp. Well, it was understandable that he was such an impressionable guy. But here. Hello, hostess. It was Ostashka. He stomped with his boys. He walked up to the table, sniffed my shot glass, licked it, and put it right back. That's right. Vodka. Tell us, grandmother. God's dandelion. What are you doing here in the village designated as non-residential on the map and in the documents. Why not residential? Take a look, both young and old. More than twenty yards, literally. Because of the war, however, the village was significantly thinned out. Okay, we will solve the problem with you. Should we stay at your place for the night? Ostashko asked impudently. Stay. Consider that half the houses are empty. The old man sitting at the table opposite us answered. Oh, thank you, father. You were helping the Soviet cause, Ostashko said, and waved his hand to the soldiers, took a fresh cucumber from the table, and put it in his mouth. We were placed in an empty house, closest to the river. Before going to bed, we ate and chatted with the locals. I noticed that their eyes were sad, despite the fact that they had a holiday. It seems that I saw that girl among the villagers, it seems, and so we went to bed. After the war, I have been tormented by terrible dreams, and my bladder is also damaged, so at night, I often run around. We were placed in a house on the very edge of the shore. The shore was very high, and the river was wide and beautiful. On the other bank, there was a field, ending in thick forest, so I go out into the street at a small pace. I go into the bushes and see something moving on the moonlit water. I took a closer look. Indeed. The boat has a lot of people in it. Well, I think, fishermen, it's about time. The boat moored to the shore. Six people jumped out of it, and everything was so quiet, without a single sound. I look again at the river, and there are already about ten boats there, all filled with people. Behind them the rafts are floating with something big. Why aren't you sleeping, man? Let's have a drink, huh? A local drunk scared me. I was silent in horror and looked at him and then at the river. You don't want to. Do as you want, but I will go swimming. And the drunk man clumsily began to slide down the hill towards the river on his ass. Stop, I shouted to him in a whisper, but it was too late. The silence was cut by the sound of machine gun fire. I recognized the sound from thousands, the sound of the German Schmeisser PP. But how? This is not possible. No. In the sky above the village itself, something very bright, similar to a star, shot up and slowly was falling, illuminating the entire village. I saw people quickly climbing up the hill. They were Germans. I fell to my knees and crawled into the house. You, my friend, don't think about it. I was not a coward in the war, but you already know. Then I was afraid of the impossibility of the whole situation. Shots and explosions washed over the entire village, crying of children and old people. The Germans stopped at the edge of the mountain and waited for the mortars to process the village. I ran to Semyon, who, after drinking, sobered up in an instant, as if he hadn't been drinking at all. Let's run, I tell him. We need to get the cars from here. Bang. A shell hit the house, right where Semyon was standing. I was stunned. There was a stinging and whistling sound in my ears. I ran out to the village square. Several houses are already on fire. 
animals engulfed in flames, were running around the village. I looked at the house nearby. You could see them in the windows. That old man, that grandmother, and that girl who met our group. They just looked at us and burned alive. This was the case in every home. While the Germans were clearing the village, I ran along the road towards the field where the cars were parked. As I ran, I jumped over Zatov's body. To my right, Ostashko screamed in pain. Several bullets pierced his chest. I ran, ran like I had never run before. I just passed the last house. I didn't turn around, I just ran. But what? What nonsense. The cars are not here. They're gone. Empty field. Screams were heard from behind. I rushed on. I ran through the forest, through branches that cut my whole body and face. Here it is, that same field with a barn. I ran to him. As I opened the barn doors, I glanced towards the village. The entire sky in that direction was illuminated by the light of the flame. I ran and buried myself in the hay. The silence did not last for long. The Germans were moving along the road. Neither of them said a word. This whole picture took place in complete darkness. Someone to my left sobbed. Next to me, huddled close to each other, a loving couple was trembling. The two soldiers stopped. The click of the shutter sounded. For the next half minute, the barn was turned into a sieve. They shot me in the arm and grazed my cheek. The couple was much less fortunate. They were dead. One of the shooters raised his head to the sky, took a deep breath, and followed the others. His comrade did the same, and I lost consciousness. I woke up with bright sunlight hitting my face. There was no roof over my head. Or rather, it was there, but rotten and collapsed. There were no barn doors, no hay, no guys whose death I had seen that night. It took me another half hour to come to my senses. My head hurt, as did my arm. After sitting out, I moved towards the village. Should I write to you that there is no trace left of the village? That is, nothing at all. Only forest and river. Our cars stood alone in the field where we had left them, safe and sound. I found no one there. No bodies, no clothes, nothing at all. It took a long time to return to camp. As soon as they saw it, they sent me to the city hospital. It turns out that the group and I were absent for a week. We were already listed as dead. I was interrogated. I said, I don't remember anything at all. Well, you understand. If I had told them what really happened, I would have been thrown into a mental hospital. A year of communicating with psychotherapists, and I'm home. I've been there more than once, but I couldn't find anything, no matter how hard I tried. I climbed into the barn and turned the whole village upside down, but no, nothing. Well, I did not tell anyone, not even my family. The secret is mine. I hope you understand me, Nikolai. Be sure to write to me, all to the same address. The letter ended there. I was not much shocked. It is a pity that the letter did not reach this Nikolai. I have a great desire to go there, but only these villages are not on any map, so now I have no idea where to go out and look. Ghost Town Be me. Driving back from Colorado with my high school friend. Let's call him Jake. It's about 2am, and Jake wants to get some gas so he tells me he's going to fill up at the next gas station. We see a big, illuminated sign with the word gas, driving through small town. All of the houses are deserted, boarded up, abandoned cars. Shit is creepy as fuck. I find it odd that not a single house has the lights on, nor any working cars parked in front. Pull up to the gas station, as this is the only thing that is providing us light. Jake is the type where he doesn't trust gas pumps, so he goes inside to pay. Jake comes back, says nobody is in the gas station. I asked him if he checked the bathroom, and he said there was nobody in there at all. Jake gets a weird vibe, and was about to pay, 
when Hugh turns towards me and says, Do you think we should just go? I replied, What do you mean? Jake said, I just have a weird feeling about being here. Jake gets back in the car, and we just drive fast as fuck out of there. A few months pass, and Jake asks me if I remember the town we came across. He said he drove by there again, coming back home from Colorado, and he swears that the town was full of people, houses not boarded up, and that the gas station was no longer there. I am not sure what to make of this. The feeling we got being there, it felt as if we slipped into another reality, and our internal alarm bells were just ringing for us to get the fuck out of there. I'll contribute with a story that I still cannot explain. Be army and a few years in, doing CQ with my NCO, out doing his checks. I'm manning the front desk late at night. Only other person with me is the extra duty guy whom I happen to know. Before he can leave, he has to mop the company offices. He's mopping, and I can see him mop from where I am. He puts mop down and comes back to check his phone real quick. As he's walking back, he just stops. I laugh and ask him what's wrong. He just asks me if the back door is locked. I know it's locked, as I locked it personally myself. Tell him yes, and he literally turns around and walks out. It's then that I see a trail of footprints in the still wet section of the hallway. He swears he did not walk into it. I double check the back door, and it is still locked. It's not just my experience either. I know many other people that have admitted to hearing footsteps in that same hallway, and when they went to look to see if someone was there, all of the auto-detect lights were still dark, with no sight of anyone. To add to that, we know that there was a suicide in the company area about eight years ago. Thanks, man. On separate occasions, I have heard the aforementioned footsteps and still can't explain it properly. The footsteps always ended, just short of the latrine we had. Why that's significant is because that's where the dude took his own life. He hung himself in the latrine. Also, I'll contribute with a story that happened to my buddy. Be my buddy, going to his barracks room when the first time he arrives at duty station, goes to sleep that night, wakes up with what feels like something choking him, thinks it was just a dream and shrugs it off, wakes up next morning, and find physical marks on his neck where he felt he was choked. Still shrugged it off, thinking he did it. This goes on for several weeks. Buddy was engaged at the time, so he gets married and moves out of said barracks room. Brand new FNG arrives to us and gets said same barracks room. First day of PT, he looks as pale as a ghost. Proceeds to tell us about something choking him last night. Most of the guys laugh when he says this except for me and my buddy. We don't know what the fuck is in that room, but he hates people being in there. Some events slash items have been changed in the story to protect the innocent. I do not own the story, it's by my brother. However, I have told my other K slash X related stories before, so this is a new one. Also, I am not a squid, so I am going to get some of the ship details wrong. Deal with it. My brother is in the Navy during Gulf War II, a good day to Gulf Hard, and is, at the time of the story, on an aircraft carrier, overseeing a bunch of fresh squids, pulling watch on the carrier. Few decades back, holy shit, I feel old all of a sudden. After the ship launched back in the mid-80s, there had been a suicide on the ship. A young ensign had thrown herself off the tower for some reason or another. The story was that it was an affair with an officer that went bad. Apparently, since her death, she had been seen from time to time, dressed in her whites from the 80s, and it was just common knowledge that she would probably show up once in a while. When he was first on the ship, they had told him all about it, and it was kind of a running joke slash warning to the guys on watch. So when you went outside on the bridge for watch at night, they would tell them, look out for the ghost of the ensign. So, the carrier is cruising on its way to deliver glorious killing machines to the Middle East and liberate all of those brown people and crush our enemies for precious oil. One night, 
a few moments into Gulf War II, my brother is overseeing the watch on the bridge. It is about 2 a.m., and even though a wartime ship can be a busy place, it is a quiet night. One of the crew on watch that night is a young black girl, and it is her first night on watch, and she is super green. That night they did not bother to tell her about the ghost enzyme, or anything in particular other than keep your eyes open and call if you see anything. A few hours pass, and everyone is checking in when they should. A bit more time passes. Everyone checks in, but new black girl does not check in. A few minutes pass, and a few more tries to reach her. Nothing. Does anyone see the new enzyme? No one sees her. Brother decides, Okay, let's go find out what is up, and yell at this girl for not paying attention, slash falling asleep, slash not keeping calm discipline. Goes out to where Enzyme should be on watch. As soon as he steps out, he sees that something is wrong. He can't see the young black girl. Turns on flashlight, and sees girl curled up in a ball, catatonic. My brother got closer to her. She grabbed onto him, and would not let go, and started screaming about a girl, dressed in navy whites. When they got her inside, and finally came around, she told them that a young white girl, dressed in an old uniform, so completely in water, crawled over the edge of the ship, where she was keeping watch. She said that the ghost did not make a sound, and just came over the edge of the ship, pointing at her accusingly, and then vanished. The girl on watch promptly screamed, slash went catatonic, until she could not speak anymore, and did not bother to radio, slash call anyone, because she shut down. She had to be taken to the infirmary after that, because she would not stop shaking and freaking out. Brother went back out to where she was standing watch to check into it a bit more and see if there was anything around or if she was just crazy and found a puddle of water where the ghost had vanished. From then on, when anyone new went on watch for that part of the ship, they made sure to mention the ghost and they never assigned another female to that part of the ship for watch at night for the rest of the time at sea. Be me. Just graduated from boot camp and checked into infantry school. First night in the holding barracks. I have 1 to 3 a.m. watch. Spooky.jpg. Other marine has the front hatch. I have the back hatch. Just sitting on a chair with a small desk. Hear footsteps on the gravel every now and then. Look outside and see nobody. This happens a few times. Halfway into my shift, hear a voice outside. Hey, firewatch. You got any smokes? Negative. No smokes here. I choke out. Silence. Air feels extremely cold. A few feet back from the doorway, see Marine in ERDL camo, face obscured. I am armed with nothing but a red lens flashlight. Shine light in doorway to get a better look. Figure is gone. Sense a lingering presence, a ghostly energy in the room. Extremely unsettled at this point. See movement from corner of my eye. Pan my flashlight towards it. A shadowy silhouette stands a few feet away from the first pair of racks and footlockers. Freezing wind rustles through the room, though the windows are closed. Heart pounding, I fix my gaze on the figure. ERDL camo faded, tattered. Still no clear facial features. My voice trembles. Who are you? The figure remains motionless, silent. Identify yourself, motherfucker. As I finish my sentence, the figure retreats, dissolving into the darkness. Saw some spoopy things during night land nav as well. Be me, earlier today, going squirrel hunting, in a woods, in a Ozarks on public land. Hike a ways in. Walking around. See a huge flock of turkeys. See a raccoon fucking around my creek. See a couple of rabbits. Find half of an 8-point, almost 10-point shed. No squirrels, but all in a good day's work. Heading back to car. Walking along Big Ass Creek, probably around 60 feet wide. Has a channel in the middle that fluctuates between 4 and 6 feet deep. Supposed to be a good panfish and black bass fishing. It's been cold and wet, so the creek is running a bit high. The banks are all muddy. Notice a couple of places where it looks like animals went down to the water and then slipped in or something. 
take a few pics as I walk, stop and look into water, notice what looks like a big dark spot under the water, looks around four and a half feet to five feet long. Notice it kind of looks like it's got a fat tail and a fat round head, probably just a log or something. Continue walking back to car, hear a small splash, look to see if raccoon bro is swimming. Water above and behind a weird log is moving slightly. Kind of looks like it's turned towards me. Keep walking, but get a creepy feeling. Notice it looks like it's drifting along behind me, kind of parallel to my oath. Stop and stare at it. Trusty and EF fudge shotgun in hand. It drifts a bit more than stops. Water is running, so it's probably just a floating branch or something that got snagged. Come to a drainage ditch about five feet deep that runs into the creek. Maybe it has a foot of water in it. Hop down and start to cross it. I swear, the log looks like it started to drift towards the drainage ditch. Scramble up the other side quickly. Keep walking. Notice the log is still tracking my path. Get a weird thought in my head. It kind of looks like a big ass hellbender. Starting to get more freaked out. Start to pick up my pace. It's moving faster too. Every drainage ditch I come to makes me want to bolt it. Get to a part of the creek where a small branch makes a kind of big loop. Ain't no fucking way I'm crossing that. Take the long way around. Don't see it in the loop. I was probably right. Just a log. Feel stupid. Come back around to the other side of the loop, following the creek again. A bit further ahead, notice what looks like the log in the creek. Well, no shit. Creeks have logs in them. Stare hard at it. Almost looks like it has two duller brown spots on its head. Get paranoid and feel like it's staring at me. Tell myself I'm stupid and keep walking. Stop for a minute to check my phone. Back to the creek. Suddenly hear a splash like something getting out of a pool and some sticks break. Oh hell fucking no. Haul ass out of there like a fucking hero. Definitely not like a pussy. Go a literal quarter mile into some open fields with no cover. Using foam map approximation, trace a roughly parallel path to the creek. Maintain a solid quarter mile separation. Get back to vehicle. Nope the fuck out. So yeah, there may be a carnivorous, five foot long fucking hellbender in the Ozark's water. What did you guys do today?